Do you know the 14 traits of successful chiropractors? We've interviewed some of the top chiropractors in the industry and have identified the common traits that they all share. Jump on over to www.chirobusinessmojo.com to get your free report today. Welcome to the Cairo Business Mojo Podcast, where we deconstruct the methods, marketing, and mindset of successful business people and chiropractors from around the world. And now your host, Dr. Richard Day. He does not lie. I am Dr. Richard Day, and this is the Cairo Business Mojo Podcast. Hello once again, and thanks so much for spending some of your day with me. Well, I'm excited today because I've got Dr. Sharon Gorman on the program. She is a veteran chiropractor. She's been in practice and has been managing successful high-volume practices running two to four simultaneously since 1985. She's personally trained over 50 doctors over the years to work in and run her practices. She's created Focus Philosophy Weekends in 1990 and has held hundreds of events over the years. She's also the recipient of numerous awards, including New Beginnings Philosophy of Chiropractic Award in 1998, Life Force 1000 Chiropractor of the Year in 2015, and Distinguished Fellow of the International Chiropractors Association in 2015. She's the co-founder of the League of Chiropractic Women, LCW, and has served as its first president from 2012 until 2016. Please welcome Dr. Sharon Gorman. Hi, glad to be here. Well, so glad to have you and I invite you to jump in and fill in any gaps in that bio that I may have missed. Okay, well, one thing is is that I've been serving on the Board of Trustees of Life University for 14 years. That's one of, uh, one of my proudest accomplishments. I'm very proud of the institution and also that I have Four kids, I can't not mention that, from 20 to 24 years old, they all attend college, and three of them are studying to be chiropractors at Life University. So I'm a mom first, so I can't go without mentioning that. (laughs) Well, those are two major accomplishments, and uh, we definitely want to get those mentioned. I want to take you back to the beginning. Why did you become a chiropractor? Oh, way back in the beginning. When I <laughs> I became a chiropractor, and I often tell this story when I speak, um, I had an uncle that became a chiropractor. I was a flower girl in his wedding, so maybe I was five or six years old. And he uh, he had my my family over at his grand opening, and you know, frequently to you know we would meet them there. And he would always adjust my parents because you know my parents always had back aches and neck strains and whatever. But my brother and I never got adjusted. I pretty young. Um, and when I was about 10 years old, I, I got mumps and I got encephalitis. I got a high fever. I was in the hospital for a couple of weeks, had spinal taps. They couldn't figure out how to get that fever to go down. And I just was getting sicker and thinner and, you know, just dehydrated. And uh, I actually had become deaf in my right ear through the course of this. It was pretty, pretty bad. And in the meantime, my uncle had been to a seminar And he became what I call a born-again chiropractor. Like, he kind of got the big idea. And long story short, he came home from that seminar and gave me my first chiropractic adjustment in the hospital. In the middle of the night, he snuck in the hospital, gave me my first adjustment. And my fever, as you would imagine, even went higher. And then in the morning, it broke. And it it was like a miracle. So I I used to tell people I'm a chiropractic miracle, But the truth is, is that, you know, the chiropractic really didn't save my life. The chiropractic philosophy saved my life. So my life has been about sharing with people in such a way, chiropractors especially, that they they don't cut people short and, and, and turn a chiropractic philosophy into or a chiropractic into a way to treat shoulder pain or pan down their leg or even headaches that it's, it's something bigger than that. And that that has been my life's work, is not only to share it with patients most effectively, but to have chiro- empower chiropractors to go home and practice chiropractic, not, not the symptom, you know, the removal of symptoms. Well, that's not an altogether uncommon story in chiropractic. You know, typically we'll have some kind of encounter that's very personal like that, and it really sets our life on a different course. Thanks so much for sharing that. I want to fast forward in time. To your graduation, when that happened, did you work for someone else or did you go straight into your own practice? Well, I I planned, uh, let me start off by saying I, I, I moved to Atlanta at 17 and went to the community college here. And uh, I actually graduated from life when I was 22 years old. And I, I basically had no business experience. So 
Uh, I thought I'd be, you know, at 22, I was definitely ready to open my own practice. <laughs> so um, the only the only problem was the the state of New York at that time didn't agree with me because um, back then, you know, you had to go state by state and take basically what what's known now as part three and part four. So. I took I took the part uh, I took the New York board because I was from New Jersey and I had family in New York and didn't pass it and I ran into a guy named Jim Sigafus at a seminar in New York and he asked me what I was up to and I said nothing like really nothing like my my parents had gotten divorced while I was at school so I was like up to my mother's couch or my father's couch and he had a practice um, back in Pennsylvania that he had sold, but it came back to him and he was going in there to build it back up. And he brought his daughter who had, uh, was a chiropractor and he, and so basically, you know, I followed him home and, um, I watched him take a practice that was seeing about 30 patients a day at the time. By the time I left, it was seeing about a hundred patients a day, only eight months later. So, you know, I tell students, as I often talk to students, that, you know, if you're going to go work for somebody, make sure you work for somebody that practices just like you want to practice when you grow up, because chances are that's how you're going to practice. You know, I, I pretty much practice exactly the way I did uh, 32 years ago when I went to work for him. Well, what were the keys to that early success? What changed after you came in contact with Dr. Sigafus? Well, I only learned how to be successful and I, and I, I, I really learned not to be inhibited. I learned to, I, I, I did, you know, the, the new patient lectures by the time I left. I, I was on a radio show. I was just totally engaged. I was playing full out. And he, I, I spent a lot of talk, time talking with him. He was, he was so alive and so, at that point he was actually creating what became the gathering, his, uh, you know, his, uh, seminars that he ran t- for the rest of his life. But I just, I just, I, I believed I could do anything because he believed he could do anything. And so I didn't have any limitations. So to go on with my story, you know, when he left the practice and, you know, his daughter stayed there and actually bought it and she's still there to this day. Very successful. But anyway, I decided, uh, you know, at that time I had uh, the Pennsylvania license. So I just wanted to get started. So I went back to an area I'd never been to before and I opened a practice and, um, it took me, I, when I, you know, I t- it took me three months to bring the practice to 100 patients a day. That's all, because that's all I knew how to do. I didn't know how to, I didn't know how to see less than that. I didn't know how to do it any other way. And he was st- still my mentor, and until the day he died, you know. And so he he was kind of coaching me. Even before he was a coach and telling me, you know, I remember my, my grand opening. I had nine new patients my first day in practice. And, I, and here I am. I'm up to like 23 years old, never ran a business. And, uh, you know, just, just just on fire, just totally on fire with with bringing chiropractic to the world. Um, you know, they, they I, I've heard them say, and it's so true, you know, if you're on fire, they'll come watch you burn. And that's that that's the story of my success. Because I had nothing, you know, I came from a middle class family and I just was not afraid to work and I had nothing to lose. And so sometimes I look back and I, I wish I would take the risk now that I was willing to take then. But now, you know, now I'm used to having certain things in life. But back then I lived in the back of my office for the first year because I couldn't afford an apartment. I was living in Cairo camp. Every Everything I did, every you know, I ate, drank, slept, breathed chiropractic so um you want to ask me a question or should i go on (laughs) (laughs) well i was gonna say that uh you know when you have nothing to lose you're coming from that place early on and absolutely you just go 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 not everyone does that but in your case you certainly did um And yeah, with no limits, it's very empowering. I talk to students as well, and that's one of the things I try to help them realize is that there's so much in your head in terms of limitations. Just go. Why not? Why can't you do that? You know, and a lot of these things that they think the fears turn out to not be really true. Yeah, I remember my dad told me one time because I would go to dinner with my dad. He'd come Monday nights, and and he told me one time he said uh, I was telling him about and we did, I did a lot of advertising back then, like newspaper advertising. Mm-hmm. And I told him about something I tried. I don't know if I was 
on placemats or, you know, like some, you know, we would just do everything and, and it didn't work. So I was telling him about that and he said, Sharon, he said, I've never met, met anyone that made as many mistakes as you. And I'm like, well, dad, you never met as many, you know, anyone that tried as much stuff as I do. <laughs> and I've built a lot of practices, but I've never built one as fast as I built that one. But it, it's, it's one of those things where I had not, you know, I had no reserves. I had no, you know, it was like, I remember I, and I bought the building because it was like a, it, the building needed so much work and I, I got, you know, I, anyway, I, I borrowed some money and I, 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 I remember when I went to the closing and the banker who was probably in his fifties and I'm in my early twenties, he said something to the effect of, you know, if you don't make two payments or three payments, but I'll, I'll start foreclosure procedures. And I, can, and I was thinking, wow, that gives me like 90 days. <laughs> like I can do anything in 90 days. He thought he was threatening me. I'm like, really? I got, I got 90 days. Right. I could do it 90 days. <laughs> well, I want to talk to you about practicing today. Are you still in practice? Well, I have, um, I, just to fast forward, go back a little bit. I ended up opening four offices in four years because I could. I was like playing a little monopoly. You know, I, I, um, I thought if I put people in freestanding buildings that were about 1,200 square feet with a, with parking lot, you know, like if I reproduced what I did and put people in there, they would do the same thing I did. Oh, I was a little silly, you know, because they're not motivated by what I was motivated of. And I had no idea how to manage people. So there was a huge learning curve. And, um, uh, you know, so I had multiple offices in the Poconos. I ended up w- opening one more and then I, w- I would sell it to, uh, associates as they were with me a certain amount of years, you know, so, so I, you know, I'd open them and then sell them. But, um, about s- six years ago, almost seven years ago, um, my whole family, we moved here to Atlanta. So I was, I, I sold all the practice to one, uh, except one. So I have one practice in the Poconos and I ha- and uh after I moved here I have a practice now here in Roswell Georgia near Atlanta and so I have two practices and um I I I usually practice right now I'm not practicing I my problem my dilemma and, and people can relate to this that have had multiple offices I can't do both if I'm in practice I almost can't have a family I I I still become obsessed I I you know I I get totally sucked into that mode of getting as many people under lifetime care as possible. So it's very hard for me to balance practicing and doing other things. So what what just recently happened within this last year is I sort of kind of, you know, I hit the wall again. And so I got an associate who's in that office that I was building and he's continued to build it. And I uh, just recently got back into doing some coaching and putting on seminars again. So it's, it's actually more effective for me to, to run practices, but I'm still in there. Like my son, one associate's taking off a few days next week, next month, my other, I'm, I'm going up to Pennsylvania. My associate's taking a seminar for four days. So it's not like I don't touch people, but I have trouble doing both being the, the main doctor and running all the other things I run in my life. Well, I want to touch on something that you mentioned, and that is, you know, when you find someone to replace you in a practice, they have different motivations and it doesn't always work. Um, are there any ways you've found to sort of reach people and become a leader to motivate folks to, to do better? Well, one thing is, is, you know, that back to what I was just saying, you can't be tired. Like I was, you know, I was, I was like, you can't be effective. You can't give people things you don't have. So if you if you're not balanced, you can't give them balance. You know, if if you're not feeling love, you can't feel, you give them love. And I have a tendency to be a workaholic, so I can't I can't source other people. I might have one practice do well, but then all the other balls fall out of the air. So what I've learned about having associates is they're there for a reason. Um, if they if there wasn't a reason, they wouldn't be there, right? So. I see my job as sourcing them and and bringing out the best of them and and actually believing in them more than they believe in themselves. And the most important thing is my relationship with them and and the ability to have you know to help them grow and learn. If if that's not there, why are they there? If they're not getting something out of the relationship, then what would keep them there? And so I used to hire superstars I mean, I still do, but I mean, when I interview people, I just look for people that I would put my money on that they were going to be successful in practice. And the one that 
was the most successful would get the job, you know, in my mind. Now it's, it, it's not based on that. It's based on how it, how it feels in my gut. And it's also based on how well, how coachable they are and how, how willing, like with me, I was so coachable to Sigifus. If he told me to jump off a bridge, I would have. I did whatever he said. And so it worked. Well, but yeah. if someone's not willing, you know, then you can, you can give them the best advice in the world. It's not going to do it. It ain't going to get done. Yeah, I've seen that uh, exact same thing myself. That that word coachable is huge, and I I have felt I'm always uh, been a coachable person in my career, um, you know. And I've had a number of different careers over the years, but uh, that's not always true for everybody. And that is such a you know that's the thing I think I would say I look at as well. We own a couple of practices and ha- practices and have a few associates. And uh, absolutely, if there's if they're not coachable, um, it's just you can't you know you can't lead. And I think you end up butting heads, or one person or another or both are unhappy. Happy. So, um, yeah, that's 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 what we look for, and I'm I'm glad you said that. <laughs> well, I want to talk to you a little bit about chiropractic in general. You know, the latest figures that I've seen indicate that less than 14 percent of the public utilizes chiropractic care, and I would venture to say it's even less than that. But why do you think that is? Well, it, uh, it's not in Atlanta. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I do, I still do screenings. When I do screenings in Pennsylvania, I'll, I'll, I'll say to people, I'll say, have you ever been a chiropractor? And you get yes or no. But in Atlanta, if you say, have you ever been a chiropractor? They look at you like you're asking them if they've ever been a dentist. Of course they've been a chiropractor. So I would always ask them, when was the last time you were adjusted? That would be a more appropriate question. And then I kind of got, uh, it feeds right into this question because how would the world look if, if 90% or, uh, a hundred percent of the population utilize chiropractor. We'd be in a different planet. And that is why I wake up in the morning because someday it's going to be that way. You know, I believe in a hundredth monkey. If we keep telling the story and, and, and showing people how to live vitalistically from inside out, someday it's, it, it, people would be embarrassed to tell you they don't go to a chiropractor. And that's not how it is right now. Why is it like this now? I don't know. But I, I think as a chiropractor, that's the biggest challenge for me. I think if chiropractic wasn't a challenge, most of us chiropractors were kind of rebels. We would have been medical doctors or dentists or lawyers. It's the challenge of, of bringing this, this message to the people that, that excites me. Well, you've coached a lot of chiropractors in your career. And what are the barriers to success that you keep seeing over and over? People sometimes have trouble seeing themselves successful. And back to my story, you know, financially, I was making so much money early in practice that I part of the reason I opened so many offices is because I wasn't comfortable having so much money, so much liquid money around. I was buying the the buildings as I was opening them because I couldn't. I, I kind of think it is Michael Jackson syndrome. You know, I was like crashing and burning. You cannot be more successful than you see yourself being or you'll sabotage yourself. So I, I think that, you know, like I spend a lot of time working on goals, but even more on my vision of what I want and how I see my life to be. And I think that people just ignore that. You know, people um, just move on and, and get into action and do stuff, but they don't really see themselves successful. That, that's key. Well, I want to, uh, well, before I move on, what can we do to change that? Is it up to the individual person or really does it take an external force like a coach like yourself? Well, it takes a coach or it takes a seminar series or we all have to have like our lifelines like that show where we, you know, they have, you know, dot, call a friend. You have to be part of a support system that will bring you forward. And for me, I need to hang around with people that are more successful than I am. Because it's a lot easier to reproduce their success than to try to reinvent it. And when I hang around with people that are more successful, I see myself that that way and I become it. Well, let's shift and talk about the marketing side of chiropractic. Uh, One of the things that I try to do in my practices is to create a patient experience in the office. And is that what you've done in your offices? And if so, can you describe what that's like? Absolutely. From the minute the person walks in the office, they could tell this is not your traditional doctor's office. I, I take pride in that. I want them to feel different from the very minute they walk in. And and the unspoken thing that's happening is the vibration is so much higher in my office than it is in the rest of the world 
because one, because we, we have purpose and we're on fire, but also because we don't let the, the negativities into our consciousness while we're in the office, which is a, a discipline because they, they, you know, they come up and we put them aside so we don't become what I consider ordinary. An ordinary person will allow, will embrace the negativity of the world. And somebody, you know, we just went through this election. People were asking me uh, questions about it. I, I was just in Rome last week and, and the people over there. And it, it was like, I almost felt a little bit ignorant because I don't really watch the news. I mean, I see some of the stuff on Facebook feeds and stuff, but I, I, I can't afford that. I can't afford, the, like they say, the luxury and negative thought. I can't afford to indulge those negatives or I'll just become ordinary. I'll become like everybody else. Heavy. As a chiropractor, I need to be light. My office needs to be light. The, the, they need to, uh, how many times have, I've taken somebody back, x-rayed and brought them back. And then when I came, you know, they were bringing them back to get adjusted. They said, oh, I already feel better. Just being in the office. And I, I often tell people, if you hear a kid crying in my office, it's because the parent's trying to get him out of the office, not getting him in the office. Because the kids want to be there. Because it just feels good. It feels right. So we have lots of things going. There's always something going on in the practice. We have a, a big bulletin board. And there's always a contest going on. Or there's testimonials up there. Or there's kids' pictures up there. There's always something going on. A, a patient once teased me and they, she said, you should have been a kindergarten teacher. You have the best bulletin board. But I have the best everything. You know, my office is first class. When when people walk in there, they feel taken care of. They feel right. We have, you know, coffee or tea on the front desk. There's always – we're always – trying to exceed their expectation. We always want them to have an experience that makes them want to go go out in the parking lot and, and check in and tell people what a great, great place they just visited. We want to be, we want to have that, you know, like you ever go to a great restaurant, you can't wait if it's, you're the first one of your friends to go to tell all your friends like, like you have a great find. That's how my office is. Well, how do you train and engage your staff in getting on board with creating that experience? Well, we train. We train on scripts, on what to say. I, and, you know, we have, to, you know, lots of procedures in place and, and procedures. And, you know, they actually free you up because then you can have fun, you know. Um, but um, we, we um, now that my offices are 800 miles away, every Monday we're on, we're, we do a Zoom call for an hour over lunch. And we talk about our goals for the week. We talk about our wins from the last week. We celebrate and we learn from our lessons and we grow as a team. Uh, we do that every week. Um, so it's not like it, we live. We, we, it's it's like we're very conscious of our success and we're conscious. You know, sometimes somebody will walk out and they won't be happy with their care and we'll talk that down. And then, you know, sometimes it will just be like, hey, you win some, you lose some. But we need to we need to pull each other up. I I, I can't emphasize that enough as a leader of the people that work with you, but even as a coworker, you, you, you need to pull each other up so that you can perform at your best. And, and the, the biggest cancer in, in running offices and having employees is if you're not happy with something, uh, if you're an employee that's not happy, you need to talk to somebody that can change it. You don't need to like talk, you know, I'd have two CAs putting down one CA behind their back. You can't do that. You, you know that, that that'll pull that's that that that'll pull the energy right back to ordinary again. Well, what kind of marketing is working best for you today? Lately, I, there's two things that are working really well. One is screenings, and I, when I first started, I mean, I you know the Chamber of Commerce had a business exchange once a year. That was my whole screening, but screenings work really well, and we, we do like lunch and learns where we we. Uh, we go into a place, bring them lunch. I mean, I'm sure you've heard of it. And um, sometimes I find, you know, I used to be like really geared up to getting lots of people at events. Sometimes I, I could do an event with 10 people and six of them become patients and I can get tons of referrals from them. It doesn't have to be a whole lot of people. But I don't bother going out to speak anymore or doing a lunch and learn or, you know, unless there's a call to action there. You know, I, I really learned that one the hard way where I'd speak at a group and, and, you know, one person would call a month later and then another person would call a year later. I, I, I don't go anywhere without my CA making appointments and uh, really uh, showing them, you know, like somehow showing them their need, you know, establishing a need. That, that's the big thing at a screening. If somebody doesn't think they need a chiropractor and, and they walk up to you at a screening, you can stand there all day. 
good luck. But if if you could, uh, you know, palpate somebody's neck and show them how their atlas is out and their chief complaint is headaches, I actually bring a Merck chart and I palpate them or I bring a Titron, establishing a need and making the appointment. That That's key. Do you have a, a marketing person run these events for you um, or do you do it all yourself with your staff? I... Uh, no, I, I have one of my CAs that actually is very good at marketing that sets a lot of this up. But my doctors do them, and I do them myself. I still do a lot of screenings. I'm really good at them. You know, you got you to gotta look at, you know, people are like, I, I remember I was doing a screening not too long ago here in Roswell, and there was this guy standing there looking at me, and it, uh, it turns out he was a chiropractor. Usually if somebody's looking at you like that, you're a chiropractor. So he was looking at me and walked over, and he goes, you know, he goes, you're really lucky, Doc. He goes, you really like doing screenings. And I'm thinking, oh, no, he goes, you're really lucky. And I said, lucky? I'm, I'm thinking, yeah, I've had a pretty good day. I signed up a lot of people. He goes, he goes, you like doing screenings. And I said, yeah, that a pencil in my eye, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm really good at them. So, you know, you got to look at what you're really good at. And as we were talking about before, I mean, I had four offices fell in love, which I didn't expect to happen so quickly. And in the next year had four kids. So I had four offices and, 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 and four kids. So I really learned how to delegate. So you, when you're learning how to delegate, you got to figure out what you're really good at. So I'm really good at telling the story, and I'm pretty damn good at clearing spines, right? And so, uh, <laughs> and you know, I have a couple other good qualities. But anyway, I, uh, I figured, like went back to when I lived in that back room in my office for the first year. I did live. I live in the back. I had no rent. You know, I lived in the back room of the office, yet I had a cleaning lady. You know, so <laughs> the moral of the story is, is, you know, I didn't want to, I didn't want to clean my, uh, you know, I wanted my office to be impeccably clean, but I didn't want to have to do that. So a lot of people try to do everything and don't do things well. I, I look at what do I do well and okay, it, like soap notes is another example. I, 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 I've never done soap notes. I've always had them done. I, you know, as with a big practice, I've been audited more than most and my notes are good, but I hire people to do that. I don't want to do that. That'll take, that'll take away my joy. I want to be in there loving on people and explaining to people what we do and, and turning on life. Well, let's switch gears. Uh, you are the co-founder of the League of Chiropractic Women. Why don't you tell us what that's all about? Well, we've got about a thousand women around the world. It's an organization that's only four years old. And, um, I was the president of the first few, four years. I'm, uh, I've, I've handed the torch over. And that, that's a big part of what LCW is about is actually uh, elevating other women and mentoring other women. Because, you know, when I went to school, I bet you 20%, if it was that high, were, uh, of the students were women. I, I'm, I mean, it was like at least 80% men. I think that's why I went. Anyway, but um, now it's 50-50. But we don't have a, enough women leaders. We don't have enough women pres college presidents on the boards. They're just, we're just not well represented. And, and it's because, uh, naturally, men mentor men. And so women need to me mentor women. And I believe that if this profession is going to get where it needs to go, it, it needs the women have to be part of the governance of it. Men are doing what men do, and they're you know they've gotten to this point. Now I'm not saying that in a negative. They're, they're just doing what they're doing. The women need to get in there and soften a little bit. There needs to be a little bit more collaboration. There needs to be. We need to bring some of the the our, our skills to the table, and and also that women have you know a huge need to belong and to you know participate and and to to be part of something that there's women that are, you know, have something in common. So there's women like myself that have been in it a while that are mentors, but then there's the women that come along that are green that actually remind us why we do it and give us the opportunity to mentor. We have, um, we found that it was, it's kind of difficult for women to get on an airplane. So we don't have that many live events, not as we did when we first started. We have some retreats at spas. I was in Scottsdale a couple of weeks ago with one of those, but we do a lot of stuff online. We have uh, an online speakers course offered by Mary Flannery. That's out of sight. I mean, the rate rave reviews. There's, there's lots of, um, we do, uh, webinars twice a month and, um, we also have chapters. We have over 20 chapters all over the world. Uh, our chapter in Milan put on an event in September. So we, 
what we found was that women that are more isolated in countries where there's a handful of chiropractors actually have gravitated to us more than women that are kind of spoiled and have it all over them like like in Atlanta. So so there's and 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 then several of the schools have chapters. Well, I uh, really like what you're doing, and I agree with you. I think that um, you know there ought to be more women in chiropractic, and I think that there are, certainly are starting to be that. But, you know, I think women are uniquely positioned to be fantastic chiropractors for a couple of reasons. I think the fact that um, women are moms and end up, you know, they, they can speak to other moms uh, in a much more informed way than I can. And that's not to say that men don't understand children, but we're not the one who had them and carried them. And I really think that, um, at least in my practices, treating moms is uh, the key, really the gateway to treating everyone in the family. They're the ones who are telling the husband to go in and stop complaining about their back pain, and they're the ones bringing their kids in for care. And ultimately, uh, if women can seize this power, this superpower, um, boy, they can do great things. Absolutely. And, and chiropractic, you know, is such an innate thing. It's such a vitalistic, you know, above, down, inside out practice. And it just comes natural to us to listen to our, our you know, our intuition. And that, and, you know, we, we know that when we remove a subluxation, the power in the body, you know, heals the body that it's not coming from outside, that we're turning on something inside. Yet as a chiropractor, we need to look at the, at the issues in our lives and the situations in our lives as a chiropractor would from inside out that that it's not the outside world that's that's making us it's it's it, it's changes that we can make inside of ourselves and it's it, it I, I guess as a child you know men are taught to suck it up and they're not taught to listen to that that innate and it, and and it's that intuition is sort of like a muscle it's like if you never picked up anything with your bicep you wouldn't have much if you didn't get used to listening to that innate wisdom you after a while you wouldn't hear it well, on this podcast, we're all about providing action steps for our listeners, and our listeners are broken up into two groups. We have the newbies, the new docs who are uh, either getting ready to graduate or have been in practice a year or less, and then we have those who have been in practice a while. They're more seasoned, but they're maybe not where they want to be. They're stuck and looking for a new direction. So do you have a single piece of advice for each one of those groups? Um, the young. I'll start with the young people. Um, with the young people is to associate yourself with other successful, you know, uh, young people or people in chiropractic. They don't necessarily be young. And uh, in talking to the students as often as I do, it starts when you're a student. It's not that you, you know, like you graduate, you walk across the stage and something happens. You, you, you start when you say you start. And so, um, there's so much power in the beginner's luck. Like, you know, I shared before how I built that practice at 100 patients a day. I've never been able to build a practice that fast again, you know, because I was so singleness of purpose. So don't don't let anything hold you back. You know, build your passion and stay connected and find yourself a seminar series or a coach, something that that you're going to go to regularly because we need that constant connection at least three or four times a year where we're around other successful people. And, uh, you know, people say, oh, I, you know, I don't need any more philosophy. You know, I, I learned it in school. When people ask me my, the secret of my success, it's that I'm a, I'm a philosophy junkie. I want to listen to successful chiropractors, and I want to listen to their, their heart, to what makes them successful and keeps them successful. So don't, 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 you know, don't hold yourself back from, you know, you're like, oh, but I should go to technique. And you, yes, you need to know your technique. You need to know everything. But that, that philosophy is going to keep on recharging your why. And that, and that fire inside you, like I said earlier, is, is what's going to attract people. As far as people in practice for a while, Sig, Sig Fus used to always say that he, he felt like people, didn't ever get burnt out of practice. You know, some people are saying I'm burnt out. They don't get burnt out. They get bored out. B O R E D. You got to keep it fresh. You got to keep it new. You got to, you got, you got to, you know, it, after a while, if you're bored and being in your practice, your patients are going to be bored. Your CAs are going to be bored. Nowadays, you can get on the web and there's so many things like the resources like your podcast and, and other podcasts and other blogs that will just keep it fresh. Keep it, keep, Keep it new for you. Always be learning something. 
I'm more excited to be a chiropractor now than I was the day I got out of school 32 years ago, without without a doubt. And not long ago, I had um, right now I I get really turned on by turning people into wanting to become chiropractors. I have I never have less than 12 students at chiropractic school at any time, and that just jives me. That that so excites me to see them. You know, I, in essence, I'm replacing myself by by sharing. You know, and and the next generation will have you know this love of chiropractic that I've gotten. But uh, um, if you if you feel like you're stuck, find somebody that can give you a little prod. It's out there. Well, I want to take a step back from chiropractic and look at uh, maybe things in a more personal way. Most of us have had a lot of success in life, and especially you have. And we learn a lot from our successes, but we learn even more from failures. Can you share with us, a? I guess it could be a professional or a personal challenge or obstacle that you have overcome and what you learned from it? Oof. Um, I've had a lot. <laughs> and I've had, you know, I've had my share. I think the first big one I had was I had, uh, when I had four offices, I didn't have a really good contract when I first started out. So I had an associate go down the street, you know, basically tell the patients that, I, you know, that, it was with my blessing and, and basically stole the practice. And that was my first financial, you know, like, oh, my goodness, you know, like, you know, because whatever your overhead is, you know, is your overhead. If you lose a big part of your revenue, you're in trouble, you know. So I had to learn how to, you know, like when you fall on your ass and, and, and we all do, you know, that, that's the thing I've come to find out. You know, it, it's inevitable. The, t- the thing that determines the man from the boys or the girls from the women or whatever is your ability to get up and brush yourself off and put your socks on and shoes on and move forward. Um, when when uh, I open a practice, you know, and, and uh, the difference now than when I first started is I know the things, you know, aren't going to always go the way I want. But I also know that that the thing that that I can do and the, my secret weapon is my ability to work. And nobody can take that from me. But when uh, I remember I talked to Dr. Nell Williams, Dr. Sid's wife, when when this had happened. And uh, I was telling her a story about when I would. So I ended up going into this practice to try to save it or salvage it. And every time I would drive to it right before I got to it, just right down the street was this other practice that had all my patients in it. And I, I, I could listen to, back then it was cassette tapes, and I could get myself in as good a mood as I wanted. But when I drove by this office, it just it took me two hours to get my head out of my butt again. And she said, um, I explained this to her, and she said, well, isn't there a different way you can drive there? <laughs> Do you have to pass her office? So, you know, you learn, <laughs> right? Because it, it, was, it was such a challenge for me. Or I told another mentor about it. Cause see, see I, I'm telling you what I did. I just, I just, I went on a search. I asked people that had more experience and said, I have all this pain. Not only was it financial, but it really hurt my feelings. Yeah. And I asked Dick Santo about it. And he said to me, he goes, well, how much is the guy paying for rent? And I said, what are you talking about? I don't know. You know, I can guess what his rent is. He's right, you know, on the same block as me, but I don't really know. He goes, well, how much is is he paying? I said, I don't know. He goes, well, how much? And I said, I I don't know. He said, well, he's using up a lot of, you know, space in your head. What are you charging him for rent? So (laughs) what I got was, right? So what I got out of that was that, you know, I was allowing this boogeyman to still hover over me, you know, because I was righteous about it. You know, like, look, at you know, it caused me some financial grief. It caused me blah, 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 you know. And that, and I get into this whole pity party where I'm sucking my thumb. And then, you know, there's got to be some payoff in feeling sorry for yourself or you wouldn't keep doing it. So, you know, I le- that's the lesson I learned. The lesson I learned is, is that, you know, you, you know, the higher you go, the farther it is to fall down. If you look down, you're going to fall down. Well, what a tremendous lesson to learn, I guess, both financially and, and emotionally. Like you said, it does hurt your feelings when you, that sense of betrayal um, from someone that you at one time trusted. Well, I want to talk about your heroes. Who are they? Well, I've already, I've already mentioned my, one of my big heroes who just passed a couple of years ago, which was, uh, Sigafoos, Jim Sigafoos, 
Uh, Reggie Gold was huge. Dick Santo, my uncle Howard, Howard Cantor, Bob Satelli. I grew up in New Jersey. So there was this really strong stronghold of philosophically chiropractors that, you know, philosophical chiropractors that we, we, they were destined to change the world. That, I, and still when I meet, I meet students like that or new practitioners, I can feel that fire, man. It, it's just, it just turns you on. And these guys were in practice a long time at that point. Um, I, these days I work a lot with Guy Reekman. He's definitely a, a leader in our time and a, a huge visionary. Um, and so I, li- I mentioned a lot of men. Did you notice that? I, did. <laughs> I, I, I got, I got a bunch of women too. Um, Dr. Nell Williams, Dr. Rebecca Ray, who just recently passed this summer. Um, uh, nowadays, Dr. Sean Powers is one of, it, it, involved with the LCW and Pam Jarbo. Um, Irene Gold, I still often eat dinner with her when she's in Atlanta. Um, there's a lot of them. There's a lot of them. And there's different things you could learn from different people. But they're out there. Well, do you have any daily habits, rituals, routines, or affirmation that you do every day to help you keep clear in your vision? Okay, here's what I do. I sit, I set my phone for a half hour. In the morning, I get out of bed, brush my teeth, and I sit in silence for a half hour. And I let... Thoughts. Sometimes I have to sit there with a paper and pen and just dump things. Like I got, you know, I remember I got to pick up my dry cleaning, and I, you know, that comes out, or you know, a resentment. I might sometimes I have to stop and I have to forgive somebody, or I have to forgive myself. But I, I sit there in gratitude, and it, uh, and I pray, and I pray, I pray, and I listen. A half hour a day. It's a discipline. I do it every single day. And it's, it's, I've only been doing it for the last couple of years and it's made a huge change in me. And after that half hour, I am, I am just ready for whatever life is going to, you know, whatever's going to come at me. I, I feel strong in my conviction and strong, you know, in, in, uh, my own constitution. And, um, I, I, I'm not, I'm not, uh, blowing in the wind. You know, I'm standing strong and, and centered. I center myself. Well, we are nearing the finish line with our time together today. But before you go, do you have a favorite book you'd like to recommend to our listeners? Uh, the Green Books, The Bigness of the Fellow Within, and only a page a day. I read one or two pages a day of a book. I, I, I also read Sigathus' stuff, I, as you could guess, Abundance of, for Chiropractors. And um, I'm also reading a book now. It's called the, Pur- the Purpose is Profit by a guy named Skip McLaughlin, which is not a chiropractic book. So I, I do read, uh, you know, I'm interested in um, in making money and, and, and I'm interested in creating a good business model. So, you know, there's there I'm always learning, always learning. But I used to try to like I used to read something and then get discouraged because I couldn't finish the book and uh, quickly enough or I had two or three books going. And now I just have the discipline of reading two pages a day out of something like I don't go to bed at night unless I read two pages a day. A lot of times it's spiritual stuff, too. That's a good way to approach it. Just break it down into something doable each day. And over time, you're going to actually accomplish a whole lot. What's the best business advice you've ever received? Hmm. Questions are getting harder. <laughs> Save money. <laughs> uh, always be, I, you know, um, be independent. Don't don't um, don't fall into the trap of of doing things just for money. After time goes on, you should accumulate enough money that you that you could you could use it. As you choose for freedom or, or, or to give back, I give a lot of money back. That, that makes me happy. I, I hope all chiropractors are prosperous and can turn around and give back to their, their schools and belong to associations. Because we're just, you know, like I said, we were in Rome last week and Life University is looking into opening a, a branch campus there. The whole world doesn't know what we know. And, you know, we're in these little pockets of chiropractic thinking that people have the benefit uh, and they're choosing not to get adjusted. Most places in the world, they don't know that they have a choice. So we need to be prosperous so that we can, we can bring it to the world. 
Well, what's the best way for people to find you and connect with you, uh, be it for the League of Chiro- Chiropractic Women or Life University or, or, or whatever else? Well, the League of Chiropractic Women is www.lcwomen.com. Uh, Life University is life.edu. And my coaching program is called The Clarity Project. And the website is chiropracticmentoring.com. And you can reach me through there or email me directly at Dr. Sharon Gorman at yahoo.com. Um, I'm, I'm looking to make a, a bigger game. Uh, after you hit 50, you realize that you probably only got about 50 more good years. And all of a sudden, everything becomes a little bit more urgent. Well, Dr. Sharon Gorman, thank you so much for spending your time with us here today and sharing your wisdom and experience with our listeners. Well, thank you for for the privilege and the honor. Appreciate you. Thanks for listening to the Cairo Business Mojo Podcast at www.cairobusinessmojo.com. 